Step 2. Orthogonality of functions. So let's repeat what our goal is in finding the Fourier series. We would like to take a periodic function and expand it in terms of its uh, sines and cosines as a weighted sum. And for now, we're going to make things a little bit easier and we're just going to consider two pi periodic functions. Meaning if we add two pi to our spatial coordinate x, we're going to get the same function value f of x back. So this is our final goal. This is a Fourier series, a general Fourier series. We have a sum over cosine nx weighted by some coefficients a n. And then we've got a sum of all the sine a and nx weighted by coefficients bn. And the question is, how do we find these coefficients? So here, our basis functions are these, cosine nx, sine nx. And here, just to give you a, a, a picture of what they look like, on the left-hand side, we've got the cosines as a, a we increase n. So for n equals 1, it's a nice function like that. n equals 2, it starts to oscillate faster. n equals 3, even faster. And same for the sines. And again, here we can clearly see that cosines are symmetric around the point x is equal to 0. And that's because they are all even functions, whereas the sines are anti-symmetric because they are odd functions. And the central question is, how can we find these coefficients a n and b n in a systematic way? And the short answer is we use orthogonality of functions. I'm sure you have come across the notion of orthogonality in the context of vectors. So let's go over that in a, a little bit of detail. So let's consider some n-dimensional space. And uh, we have an orthogonal basis on this space, meaning we've got all of these unit vectors pointing in all the n possible directions. So any vector in such an n-dimensional space can be written as the following sum. Here, the vector v is written as a sum of vx, uh, vj, along the um, direction of the unit vector ej. And this basis of orthogonal, what that means is that if we take the inner product between any two unit vectors, uh, ej and ek, any of these basis vectors, then they are equal to delta jk, where this delta jk is equal to zero, except when the indices are equal, except when j is equal to k. So all of these little unit vectors pointing in all the possible directions, um, all of these basis unit vectors are orthogonal. As an example, you can think of the ordinary three-dimensional space where we've got our um, uh, x, y, and z direction, in this case, we're just calling them E1, E2, and E3. And we've got some vector pointing over here with components V1, V2, V3. And we know how to find these components. All we have to do is we take the inner product between the basis vector Ej and the vector itself. So writing that out, we get Ej inner product with the sum over k of vk, ek. And now we use the orthogonality condition, and what we get is we get the following sum. We get the sum over all the k of the coefficients vk times delta jk. But we said that all of these deltas are equal to zero, except for uh, uh, j is equal to k, meaning that the only term over here that's non-zero will be vj. And this is the uh, systematic way how we can find the vector coefficients. We say that the coefficients along the jth direction is vj is equal to the inner product between the basis state corresponding to that uh, direction, ej, and the vector itself. And this will be the idea uh, also in finding the Fourier coefficients. And now we will start extending the, the notion of inner product to functions. But for now, let's just still stick to vectors and see what the inner product between two vectors is. We've got our first vector, u. It's some n-dimensional vector written in this form. We've got a uh, coefficient u1 uh, along the direction of basis, state, basis vector e1, u2 along e2, and so on, up to un along en. And similarly, for our second vector v, we've got coefficients v, v1, v2, v3, up to vn. And we know what the inner product of two vectors uh, is. It's just 
the sum of all of the products of u1 times v1 plus u2 times v2 and so on up to un times vn. So now let's think of functions in a slightly different way. Let's think of them as vectors. How we do that is here we've got our uh, smooth function varying with x and let's just slice it up into, um, into these segments. So we're going to look at some spatial coordinate x and at that point uh, the value of the function is given by f of x. Then we're going to move by some uh, constant delta x to the right and to the left. So we're going to add delta x to x and we're going to subtract delta x from x. And we're going to get the value of the function at those points. And we can write these functions as a vector, as a column vector here. So if our function extends over all space from minus infinity to infinity, then this vector will be also infinite dimensional. If we are considering um, just a small region, uh, like a two, peri two pi periodic function, then also this vector will be finite dimensional if delta x is finite. So we're going to order them as follows. We're going to start from the negative value at the, at the top, and we're going to go all the way down to the positive value at the bottom. Positive values for x. And here you can see the analogy between functions written as vectors and vectors themselves. Each of these uh, components, each of these coefficients, each of these values, the value of function at x minus 2x, is basically the component of a vector uh, with respect to some basis state before we had en. Here we just have the spatial coordinate x minus 2x, x minus delta x, x, x plus delta x, and so on. So we can think of all of these um, x values as our basis. And all of these uh, values of the functions as our components that determine our vector. So now, how do we take the inner product of two functions? It's in the same way as we do with vectors. We have two functions, f and g, written in the vector form. So we have the following. The inner product between two functions is a sum of f at x minus delta x times the val uh, value of the function g at the same spatial coordinates, g at x minus delta x. And same for the uh, next spatial coordinate x, we've got f of x times g of x, and so on. And we do this sum all the way from either minus infinity or minus pi or whatever our interval is up to the um, upper interval, uh, uh, the upper bound. That could be plus infinity or in our case plus pi. But the thing is that if we keep this uh, delta x finite, if we just slice these functions with some finite width, then we're not going to get um, a good approximation to the function. What we have to do is we take the sum and we have to take also the limit as delta x goes to zero. So all of these values um, between x and delta x, they're getting squashed closer and closer together to get the accurate um, approximation to our function. And when we do that, what we are actually doing is we are rewriting the sum as an integral. So the inner product of two functions can be written as follows. It's the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the product of the two functions, f of x times g of x with respect to uh, x. And now we can immediately see what it means for two functions to be orthogonal. If this inner product if this integral is equal to zero, then we say the two functions are orthogonal. So now let's consider some uh, examples. Let's go back to our sines and cosines and say that our first function f of x is given by sine mx. And our second function g of x is given by cosine of nx. And let's compute the inner product. You can just do this, punch it into Wolfram Alpha or Mathematica, and you will get the answer. But let's, uh, uh, let's solve it uh, graphically. So we can plot these functions. And here on the left-hand side, we've got the case when m and n are equal, meaning the sines and the cosines are oscillating at the same frequency. Here at the top, we've got sine x times cosine of x, and we get the following function. Here at the bottom, we increase the frequency uh, uh, by a factor of 2, and we've got sine 2x times cosine of 2x, and we get the following function. Whereas on the, on the right-hand side, 
we are considering uh, the case when m is not equal to n, and we get the following functions for various m's and various n's. Now, let's look at the integral of these functions. Here, for example, when m and n are both equal to 1, we can see that we get a positive contribution here, this green, uh, green area under the curve here, but that will cancel with the negative contribution represented by this red area over there. And also for this other, other interval over here, we've got a positive contribution and a negative contribution. So all of, all of these areas, they will cancel, meaning the integral will be zero. And the case is the same if we keep increasing uh, m and n. Now let's look at the case when m and n are not equal, here on, represented on the right-hand side. It's a little bit uh, more difficult to see, but again you see that you've, we have the positive contribution uh, over here, represented by the green areas, and they cancel with the negative contributions to the integral, represented by the red areas over here. So immediately we can say that the um, integral of sine mx times cosine nx with respect to x is zero, meaning these two functions are orthogonal. Now let's look at a different example. Now let's consider both functions to be sines oscillating at different frequencies. So we have to compute the inner product between sine mx and sine nx. And again, let's plot that. And we see that if they are equal, if m and n are equal, then we have the following, uh, following curves. And here we're disregarding the case when they are equal to zero because then automatically we see that the integral is zero as well, since sine of zero is equal to zero. So on the uh, left-hand side, again, we have the situation where both functions oscillate with the same frequency, and on the right-hand side, we see functions oscillating with different frequencies. So let's color in the areas under the curves, and we see that when the signs are oscillating at different frequencies, then the areas cancel, meaning the integral is zero, meaning the two functions, f and g, are orthogonal. However, on the left-hand side, we see that we only get positive contributions to the integral, meaning that it's not zero anymore. So how do we evaluate it? Again, you can do it uh, with some clever software, or you can do this nice, neat little trick that I will show you now. Let's consider the integral of sine squared x plus cosine squared x with respect to x. We know that sine squared x plus cosine squared x is equal to 1. So we are integrating between minus pi and pi of a function that's just equal to 1, so we know that evaluates to 2 pi. Next, let's consider what's the integral on the same interval of sine squared x. We can see by plotting the sine squared and cosine squared x that the integrals on, of these two functions, even though the functions are different, the integrals are actually the same. You can just compare the areas under the curve of sine squared x with the area under the curve cosine squared x. And you can see that they are the same. Therefore, the integral from minus pi to pi of sine squared x is equal to the same as the integral of minus pi to pi of cosine squared x. And since we know that the integrals of these two functions add up to 2 pi, we must have that sine squared x is equal to pi, sorry, the integral of sine squared x is equal to pi, and the same for the integral of cosine squared x. Therefore, we have solved our problem. We have computed our inner product. Uh, what we said for sine squared x holds true also for sine squared of 2x and sine squared of 3x and so on. All of those evaluate to pi. So this is our inner product. When either m or n is equal to 0, then the uh, inner product is also 0. The functions are orthogonal. When the um, m uh, are not equal to n, automatically it's 0 and the functions are orthogonal. The only time when the functions are not orthogonal is when they are oscillating at the same frequency, but it's not, it cannot be zero. And you can repeat the same procedure for cosines when you have two functions, cosine mx and cosine nx, and you will find a very similar result. The only difference here is when either m or n are equal to zero, then the inner product evaluates to 2 pi. Now, why were we going through all of these uh, uh, computations of inner products, you will see that in the next step.